When it comes to getting the most out of any race car, understandably the best way is to spend time out on the track optimizing all of the individual components. Of course track time is also incredibly expensive and in a drive to bring costs down we're seeing more and more series limit the amount of track time available. We're here with Taka from Jota Sport to talk about the use of simulators in professional motorsport and how these simulators can get the team on top of a setup much quicker, cutting down on the track time required and getting the best results possible. So Tucker, let's start before you even go to a racetrack. You're using some simulation software to simulate the car on the racetrack. So I'm not talking here about sitting in front of a, a screen driving the car. I'm talking about the actual engineering aspect and the dynamics of the car. Can you tell us what that system is and how that works? Yeah, so we use uh, static simulation software that's called Optimum Dynamics from a company called Optimum G. Um, we use that software to basically build a model of the vehicle and then build a model of the track. Then all setup items are put into this model. And then from there, we simulate various aspects of the circuit, whether it be high speed cornering, the whole track, just the straights. and from there, try and adapt our setup from learning from pre, like real life experience, and then basically test items that we want to test to gain understanding of changes that we will make to make the car go faster. So for example here, one of the aspects we looked at before this interview was just making a single change to the likes of the anti-roll bar or two changes, maybe anti-roll bar and a spring rate change. So you can then model those changes through the range of available adjustment and get an idea from the simulation as to how that's going to affect the dynamic handling of the, of the car. Yeah, exactly. And we make a point of not focusing purely on the lap time. Because if we purely focus on lap time, there are ways to cheat simulation in terms of getting additional grip just by stiffening the car. Um, because of time modeling, it's really easy to just cheat it with camber or lateral G and track grip. But we focus mainly on the balance of the car in terms of, for example, when you said changing bars or springs, we want to understand, okay, if the car is understeering on a weekend, how do we quickly adapt the car back to where we want it in terms of a roll balance or lateral load transfer. And now what you, you can then do once you've got a really good handle through the simulation software and the simulator itself which we'll talk about next, uh, you can actually uh, essentially provide some data to the engineers that they will take away to the race weekend. So they've kind of got a cheat sheet for exactly what you said, if the car's understeering they know straight away what changes you've already proven on the simulator will work, again cutting down on testing time. Exactly. and. Additionally to things like uh, springs and bars, we, because of how aerodynamically dependent the car is, we have to hold the car up with third elements and things like bump rubbers and those gaps become critical to how fast the car is. So from everything from tire pressures to spring gaps to bump rubbers and, and how much gap is required is all set up statically before we even go. You know, there's always talk of Formula cars having to change things when wind direction change happens, but th and that is true. Um, we're slightly less sensitive because it's a bigger, heavier car, but we do have to change things according to track conditions. So it's a case of trying to cover a wide variety before you go, because I think we spoke about it earlier, the decision you might make two weeks before the event is going to be way better than the decision in session. Yeah, I, th I think that's really easy to overlook is when you're actually at an event, you're under time pressure, it's difficult to sit back with a clear head, look at data and then make a decision. Two weeks before the event, you've got the absolute ability to do exactly that and then you can provide the engineers with that information. So they can make a snap second decision, get the right result quickly and easily. Now. When we're talking about simulation software like this, there is understandably a huge amount that goes into it. A car is very complex, the racetrack that it's driving on also incredibly complex. So how do you get all of that information in the first place? Like just one aspect we talked about was tyre modelling. So how do you get the information required on the tyre that you're running in order for the simulation to be able to do its job correctly? So we're really lucky with the uh LMP2 program where we're working with Goodyear and Dunlop to they provide a very simple or not simple a good Pajica model 
um, where they've used a truck and trailer rig to basically give us all the numbers to build a Pachika model. If we didn't have that, we'd either take the tire to a truck and trailer rig or you can actually build a, a simplified um, tire model from data. Um, it's, again, tire is so organic that it's really hard to do. Um, and the data that you get from the car, you have to be perfectly confident, firstly of the data coming in, but the track condition, the temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. And when you don't have that full understanding and the sensors are limited on an LMP2 car, without uh, quite a few more sensors, which we can only run in testing, it's very hard to do. This is really a case of garbage into the system equals garbage out to getting it right in the first place. Now you've just talked about the tyre. The other aspect I'm interested in is getting some accurate information about the track. And uh, I mean, one aspect of just looking at a corner, the, the radius of the corner, the speed that the car's going through, going through the corner is one thing, but do you need to take into account the surface condition, maybe bumps or anything specific about the track that you're going to need to deal with? Yeah, exactly. The the for example, we Sebring is notorious for being extremely bumpy, and if we put a completely smooth track model in to to simulate Sebring, we'd go very fast, and that'd be great. But it's not realistic. We don't race on simulators. <laughs> exactly. So we have to, you know, take this magic box of simulation and really apply logic to it. Where because the simulator doesn't know any better, you have to apply logic, and then the better your track model, the better your data will be in real life. So when we take a track model in static simulation, we do ignore bumps in order to understand pure balance and pure um, aero figures. But when you take it into the driver simulator, you really need to apply real bumps and that will completely change a driver's um, technique through particular corners. For example, again, going back to Sebring, T17 at Sebring has got a massive bump in the middle of the corner, so you can't take a normal apex. And if you had a completely smooth track in the simulator, the driver would be no, no wiser and not actually getting any use out of the sim. So that's a nice segue into the actual driving simulator. So we've dealt with the simulation software, looking at the car, looking at the track and getting a, a base set up. So again, before you go to the racetrack, that data is then loaded into your driving simulator and then the driver can go through and test and see how, how the system works. So we're not talking here about PlayStation, this is a serious simulator. And because we've just talked about the track conditions, again, this really comes down to getting an accurate track uh, map. So how, how does that work? How do you get the right data for the track? So uh, there are plenty of tracks made by people in their bedrooms and, and it's amazing that they do that. But we rely heavily on, on other companies providing laser scan track models. Um, it's the reason we rely so heavily on other companies is because it's so expensive to do. But um, fortunately, we go to big Grand Prix tracks or very uh, famous racetracks. So the, it's becoming more and more normal now for laser scan to be a th um, available. Um, and without that, when you, it, the simple things of a curb being too steep or too shallow, and that can affect your lap time massively just because your minimum speed will be so different. Um, so yeah, we rely really heavily on, on laser scan tracks. Now with your particular simulator, the actual uh, driving capsule, the, the car that the driver's sitting in doesn't move. And we've seen obviously the likes of F1 teams, they've got uh, much more sophisticated systems, obviously which come at a much larger price. Uh, but uh, talking again off camera, there are some downsides with uh, a simulator that actually provides motion in terms of the way the driver uh, feels everything. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? So um, usually with a motion simulator, it really requires calibration to an individual driver um, because each driver feels understeer or oversteer differently. So uh, also when you think about a high speed loaded radius corner, the driver cannot possibly feel that in a simulator because the, the G is not long enough. Okay, there is talk about Formula One cars using rails and rigs and all sorts and spinning tops, but um, the complexity of that is, we just don't have the capacity to do that. So on top of that, you know, the, when you have something that's moving, 
and your ears and eyes aren't calibrated to it, the likelihood of sickness and vertigo is massive. So it's just simplified for us. So if you've got an incredibly expensive motion rig, but you're causing your driver to suffer from sickness and vertigo, really defeats the entire purpose. Exactly. I, I've wasted days and days trying to get over the driver's sickness without actually learning anything. So um, in, previously using motion simulators. So. Now, I think a lot of people sitting back watching this will think, well, that's all well and good, but really you're just playing video games. A and this is not the case at all. Your system is very complex and you're actually replicating a race weekend whereby when the driver's in the simulator, you've got a race engineer talking to him via radio and you've got a data engineer actually looking at the data as well. So I guess for us who have come from maybe the PlayStation World, for example, uh, it's hard to maybe understand how accurate the car can feel and how much data the driver can really give you from it. But this is really a, a tuning tool that can be used and it's accurate and effective. Yes, it, it is. Uh, but we definitely emphasize the, the driver simulation on, um, on track learning. So like I say, with the, with the laser scan track, it's really important for us to be able to get the driver up to speed quickly. And by running it like a race weekend, you know, he's had a month off and it just gives him that extra head start going into a race weekend. Now, I think a good example of this that uh, w was mentioned to us is a track that you had two drivers go to that had never been at the track before. Yeah. So no experience with the track. I can't remember if it was Barcelona, was it? Uh, Road America. Uh, sorry, Road America. And uh, one of the drivers was able to come here to your base in the UK, spend a day on the simulator, and when they got to the track, they were within two laps right on the pace. Whereas the other driver, unfortunately, with a time clash, couldn't actually make it to the simulator, and that took a full 45-minute session for the driver to get up to speed. So safe to say that's invaluable in terms of uh, running time of the car. Again, time is money when it's, when it's a race car. Exactly, and when... When it is a case if you haven't been to a circuit, or even if you have, and you know a curb's changed, or or it's raining, or it's dark, we can simulate all of those items in the in the sim, and it's it gives us a head start. Firstly, on hopefully our competition, but the driver, as much as we have long sessions of an hour and a half, we have to get three drivers through the car in those hour and a half sessions. So the driver before qualifying will do a maximum of an hour and 10, 15 minutes in the car. So, you know, he's got all day or all night as long as he wants in here. So it means that he can get all of the niggles out, you know, oh yeah, I'm driving like this today. That can be taken away by the race engineer and the data engineer sat with them. The other aspect here is you can actually retrieve data from the simulator and analyze this in Motex i2 Pro. So you're actually getting data in exactly the same way the data engineer is looking at it at the track. Yes, exactly. So um, we, once, once a... Uh, simulation session has finished we normally take it upstairs and go through the whole analysis as though it were a race weekend so we concentrate a lot on making the car go fast but the driver I think particularly in endurance racing has a massive part to play in that it's it is endurance and it's the body and the car has to last a long time so anything he's doing to look after the car is just as important as going fast in the car. Now, in terms of your final results with this, uh, if you take a typical race track that you go to, the driver spends some time here on the simulator and then actually attends the track, same conditions. What sort of difference in lap times you've seen between the simulator and the actual race track? So it does depend on track condition, but we, we aim to be within a second of the quality time um, and then race time maybe a bit further away depending on the fuel save, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, within a second, we're happy. If, if we're outside of that, we're generally pissed off. <laughs> it's uh, great to see how you are applying that technology to save money and make the car faster straight out of the transporter. What I've taken away from this is that we definitely need to upgrade our simulator technology back at our home base, but thanks for the chat. No worries. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.